Judy Durstein, I'm the director of the Allen Memorial Art Museum, and we're really thrilled to have you here today for the opening weekend of Front. Um, it's just a real thrill and a privilege to be partnering again with Front. Um, this is obviously the second iteration of, of Front, and it's the second time that this gallery has actually been used by a Front artist um, as part of the show. I know you don't really want to hear from me. Um, you want to hear from Ahmed Oh, who's here, who's the artist behind this incredible work of the Clinton's Barricade. So I'm going to turn it over to him, and of course, um, I will be happy if there are questions later about the Allen itself, I'm happy to answer those. But Ahmed, you take it away. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks everybody for coming. I'm really happy and honored to be here with this installation. And uh, it's, a, it's a special one. It's, a, it's the first time this version we do in the West, in North America. And uh, every time we involve with the museum and museum's collection, and uh, this is a very special museum, and I was uh, positively surprised to see how diverse is the collection when I came for site visit in December. We went down and looked through all the collection and we did a selection of long lists of artworks so there are around 80 artworks potentially to be included uh, with this installation. But going back to the story of the work, it comes from 1849, uh, very well known uh, anarchist uh, uh, Mikhail Bakunin uh, proposed this to his friends in Dresden. Uh, he was uh, there when uh, they were making barricades against the Prussian army, monarchy at the time. And uh, he proposed his uh, friends to bring original artworks from the National Museum uh, collection and put it in front of the barricade so the army would dare to destroy the barricade if they see original artworks uh, hanging on the barricade. So this contemporary idea of Bakunin from 1849 was not uh, taken serious at the time. So his friends didn't take this idea serious and never never really realized. Um, and in 2015, when I was doing the first version of this installation uh, with Van Abbe Museum in the Netherlands, uh, I proposed them Bakunin's idea. I said, well, uh, maybe we could activate this idea now. And uh, what is important with it is the contract on the wall. So if you have a moment, if you have time, it would be great if you can read through it. Um, so the contract, this conceptual contract, comes with the word which shows that it's not just a symbolical piece. It's, a, it's, a, it's an installation includes the original works from the collection, uh, could be potentially activated in times of uh, you know, uprisings in the future. So if in case a museum buys this work, it's an unsigned uh, contract, so it's still a conceptual contract here. Uh, but we did uh, do that in Netherlands in another museum in Amsterdam at the Stedelijk Museum. They, uh, they also had the contract like that. And then towards the end of the exhibition, they decided to uh, uh, get the work for the collection and they signed the contract. So it gives the responsibility to the museum in the future if there is an uprising in Netherlands, was, uh, we did a Dutch version there, um, they will have to give it back to the streets. So the work needs to go back to and travel to the streets. So I... Always think the artworks have this kind of back and forth between life and art, and uh, and then they sometimes return to the museum. Uh, they are not always staying in where is in a dedicated place. Also, museums do change functions. If you think of what is happening also now when we were doing it in Europe, you don't you, nobody imagined this kind of radical times in Europe. But now with the uh, war in Ukraine, uh, we see that it's possible. Um, I actually exhibited in Kiev in 2012, and it was it was not the time that you would imagine what's happening now uh, back then. And that very same institution became a kind of a shelter and different function, basically. And now they just recently reopened it. So this transformation, even in art and culture places, and the role culture plays, the cultural heritage plays, that it needs to be protected during war times, during extreme times, but also it has this value, the surplus value, and that sur surplus value we could think in many different ways. So uh, I don't see the museum storages as graveyards. As I, I see them as uh, places to be activated. And this work kind of allows that conversation and process. We did work with the students here. Uh, it's a very unique opportunity. 
and we use that opportunity to go through the works like according to the backgrounds, the diversity, and the content in the artworks. And uh, we, uh, we went down to 13 artworks included in this uh, installation. So we have out the jerk, the cement, you might recognize some of them are more uh, valid and more well known, some of them are less known. Uh, artworks, and we have a list of artworks uh, if you're interested. If you have a bit of more time, I would recommend you to read the contract as well. And I'm here today to answer uh, questions because it's a complex work. Uh, it has been discussed since 2015. Uh, in every context, it's different. And also, the times have been changing. Um, and we are updating the contract con constantly, locally as well, working with the museum lawyer. So it's not just an abstract conceptual contract, but it's really based on a human rights declaration and from a lawyer's perspective as well, creative perspective as well. Yeah, if anybody has questions and if you are interested, you can see the list over there uh, of the artworks as well. Yeah. So how much did the like, political moment influence the choices that you made or would the works have called out to you in a particular way to be included without thinking about the contemporary? <laughs> and being especially the Phoebe Smith Shield debates about abortion, Roe versus Wade being overturned, all of these kinds of things. It's a very potent object. I mean, that, that, that debate was not happening with this work entering the collection here. And also, nobody knew this work was going to happen here. So we have this kind of coincidences, set of coincidences, you know. Uh, I could not decide what entered in the past, the last the case in the collection, but we could go through because usually it's like massive amount of artworks and donated uh, by different people and, you know, uh, some artists are known, some artists like always stay in the storage, so never, uh, so some of these works have been on display, you might be familiar with some of them, and some of them actually for the first time uh, coming out of the, uh, storage. So, uh, looking through that and then deciding what could fit best, also the discussion with the student help as well, uh, it is always contemporary. So, as I said, the idea comes from 1849, but it was a contemporary conceptual idea by Bakunin. Uh, so, and contemporary art did not exist at the time. So, it's the same, same situation. If this work uh, has been around because of that reason, because the debate around it is not getting old, it's not a trend, you know, it's a very uh, alive debate, and it becomes more and more alive. Uh, and nowadays we're reading the function of museums and institutions and heritage, what to do with art and culture heritage, how to activate it. This is always a, a very lively debate. So uh, it's not that the works have to be direct about politics, mm -hmm. but this whole notion of multiple function is very important. And the work kind of brings up those questions and debates. And that's why it's still around, I believe. So we built a comprehensive idea um, by being you know, one of the students in this political moment. Uh, if we go back to Bakunin's original idea, it was based on a shared cultural background, shared cultural values, shared ideas of what was precious, right? Who is this protecting for or from? Because it seems to reflect, you know, in our polarized landscape today, right? it seems to reflect one set of cultural values. Yes, it's a speculative. So, you know, a division in the past, then, that's why we don't have actually the, the collections are usually not that diverse, especially when I work with like all, older museums in Europe that has been around over 100 years. You hardly find a woman artist, so you hardly find an artist, an artist of color. So, this is a decision of that mentality of the time, you know. So, they were defining cultural heritage back then, or, you know, uh, colonial history as a kind of golden age and like celebrated history and this vision has been changing over the years and the very same institutions also transforming themselves so collection changed slowly and those old things doesn't disappear there are a lot of uh, there are some things that we can actually bring it up here it's really not okay to put on display right now so we really install the work from the today's parameters you know today's political climate uh, so if I was installing maybe next year uh, or in two years and in five years, we would maybe all discussing with students 
uh, the, the, by that time, collection would change, yeah. not maybe dramatically. So, or the vision, the mentality of the students might change. Not so. It, I see it goes better and better. But if you don't protect it enough, it can go backwards. So, protecting cultural heritage can go towards a very conservative direction as well. You know, like over uh, respect uh, to artworks they don't sometimes require that respect. Some of them actually polarizing, and some of them are not the artworks should be even in collections. But some of the artworks supposed to be in collections, they never entered the collections or they never became visible. You know, so. Uh, kind of like readjusting the factory settings, like this work is a bit like that. So we go to the collection, see what we have, and talk and have the debates in a, as contemporary as everyday way possible, uh, and even update the contract all the time until it's signed. Uh, so it's always, you know, uh, fresh, always so it's, new. So it's a statement of value. It's a statement of value. For the people that were involved. Yes, yeah, of course. Uh, not every every outfit is not there for the value. I mean, though it was a puzzle was about that. Like Bakuni wanted to put a piece from uh, Raphael, you know, mm -hmm. like it was the most valuable piece at the time in Dresden and at the museum. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, last time instead of the museum we had the Malevich, and that was 80 million euro insurance value. Next day, a broken glass uh, window, you know, mirror. Uh, look like the painting. So <laughs> these two objects side by side in the museum, they didn't represent the same value, but together they become something else. So I think uh, some of the works are presented, but we also really think through the collection. Some of the things we think they are not as valuable, put it side by side with those works, it's important to give them that visibility they deserve long, long ago, but only now we are able to do it. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you sort of came to this idea. Um, so 2015 was when was that when it was Yeah, 2015 was the first one. So and 2013, 20, uh, 11 and 12, when was it 2011, when Occupy Wall Street happened? I, I happened to be in New York at the time and pass by and see it. It was a tiny park. It was a big moment, a financial moment, but it was this triangle, small park, highly uh, under surveillance, and a small group of people, but it had effects globally. And uh, two years after, uprising in Istanbul happened, and I was there for during that two weeks, and those two weeks period of time still have an impact, like the whole country transformed. Uh, good and bad ways, you know, like because it has such an impact. So witnessing an uprising in person is not like talking about 1968 student uprising, you know, uh, in Europe or in Tunisia and here and there, like looking at black and white photos from archives is a different thing. So uh, same thing happened in Stelic Museum when we were installing. Actually, the museum director was a student in 80s when the uh, Dutch army went to the streets right next to the museum. So it's so hard to imagine that it's not so long ago, but in the Netherlands, army going to the streets to stop anti-squad movements and their barricades. This is quite surreal, but it's a real thing. So, um, my personal experience, of course, helped to imagine seeing barricades are made in Istanbul overnight uh, in front of my eyes. So, this also made it easy to imagine. Uh, it wasn't just a historical fact anymore for me. Thank you for being here. I think I speak for all of us uh, when I say it's such a pleasure to have you here in person. Uh, I'm from a country, Bosnia. Used to be former Yugoslavia. And uh, seeing your artwork in person, I wonder what type of dialogue you think it might spark in Bosnia, where um, the worst genocide happened since World War II, and when the country and the people were attacked, that only was it an attack on um, like the society and the humans itself, but also there was yeah. a cultural genocide going on. Yeah. So the perpetrators especially focused on not only um, getting rid of the people, but also getting rid of the arts and the culture uh, and anything like meaningful to society, uh, you know, that represents the people. Um, what type of dialogue do you think your exhibit might spark in a place like Sarajevo? 
where there's still a lot of uh, yeah. ethnic tensions. Yeah. And the people that are still there are trying to fight or find ways to preserve their culture, um, you know, from what happened to them. Yeah, I've been in Saro a few, few times. Uh, also, Konich, where there's a uh, biggest uh, shelter uh, built by Tito, and where they were doing a biennial, and first people entering there after the military and army, NATO soldiers who were artists. And we were giving like this uh, complete freedom to do something with this uh, frozen history of a place like that. And, you know, um, but the memories are fresh, right? I didn't do this work there, but it, this work didn't exist back then. But when I entered a place like this, when I was in, in Sarajevo, um, you can see that how it trans transforms itself to everyday life, like how an artist should respond to that as well. That freedom I was giving in that uh, completely amazing uh, shelter, like everything untouched since such a long time, and the latest technology back then, but they're like typewriters, like, like semi-computers, uh, emergency call phones, and like place that is built for China people to survive six months. Uh, I was really amazed by the fact that, and then I was really terrified by the fact that I had the freedom to do anything with those things. So I didn't touch any of the furniture, change some artists, like start cutting things and doing things, really not respecting the historical heritage. And I was really thinking about what can we do about something very fresh, but also not so far away, you know. Every time I do something in Western Europe, Western part of Europe, like this debate as if I'm talking about my own background and something far away, a trauma that is far away. When I'm in Sarajevo, I'm more comfortable. When I'm in Eastern Europe, I'm more comfortable because it's right there. It was happening not so long ago. I don't have to explain so much, you know. But when I'm like in Amsterdam, I always have to justify this is not about a trauma happening somewhere else. It could happen any moment there, right there as well. So it's not this hierarchy between the crisis and traumas around the world. So we are in a safe zone and then the other part is unsafe that people are used to and supposed to be used to uh, dealing with that. So we really need to uh, confront with that kind of uh, judgmental thinking. And there's an amazing collection in Sarajevo uh, donated artworks, but uh, that collection never became public because the, uh, the, they, was, they never were able to build the museum. Uh, and there, there was another national museum which had to shut down because they, they didn't, they couldn't cover electricity and gas to run the museum. So this is all happening still in borders of Europe. And yes, for me, it was important to witness things also myself, but I don't necessarily need to wait until I witness uh, to act, to understand as an artist as well. So uh, I was, um, for a long time criticized just only because I was like going to somewhere and maybe an earthquake happens there, maybe uh, an uprising or war happens there, then I immediately start to transform my artwork there into something else to respond what's going on. And I was criticized, uh, even named as crisis artist <laughs> at the time. And now no one says that anymore because it's everywhere. So when it's everywhere, like I kind of relax a little bit more. No one comes to me with that kind of argument why I have this special interest in the politics and crisis and I don't have to necessarily even talk about it anymore because we are all in it and there is no hierarchy between, uh, you know, the global south and global north and so on. So everyone is basically experiencing actively every day and we are responding, in a, responding to it in uh, a uh, creative way. So this work, um, it's actually very timely to bring it even after seven years. Um, uh, here in the US, this debate, I think it's important to have it. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, you have a very particular selection process of these artworks to be together in, the, in your artwork. What is the most challenging one or story you would like to say that? was maybe difficult to put in, or that was a debate revolving around, just to be placed together. Yeah, like Raquel Mendeta's piece, uh, one of the students said, this work shouldn't be on the barricade. And I was thinking why, maybe it's not known, or it's not beautiful enough, or it's not important or special enough. 
for me, it was like when I saw, I was like mesmerized because I didn't know Anna Mendieta and the sister. And we are still trying to find a space and place for Anna Mendieta in the history of art next to Carl Andre. And, you know, like dealing with that debate. And then all of a sudden you have a sister also to insert in that history, you know, which has been always an issue. Um, uh, it's not actually an amazing thing to have a family member who is in the art world. And then if you're an artist yourself or in the art world as well, this, this, uh, prejudgments, uh, you know. So I was really impressed that actually I like this work and I want to, I would rather have it. So it's, it's the only disagreement I would say with the students I, I had, one of the students, uh, and we talk, talked about it and include still. And I think it was one of the hidden, hidden important parts of the collection to bring it up to the debate, you know. Hi, thank you. Thank you for this talk and your work is so meaningful right now. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the process of working with students? That what was the experience like? Um, is that something you do? Yeah, I mean, I do all the time, but uh, unfortunately it was during COVID. This was supposed to happen last year. And the year before I was supposed to come for a workshop, really spend time in person. I would rather do that. We had to do it over Zoom. And it was more, you know, isolated, long distance process. Uh, although I was able to come for a site visit, but it was the time students were not around. But I, I did come here. It was important for me to come see the collection in person. But normally, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. we would take more time. And in person, I would rather do that. Because I've been installing and experiencing with the museum stuff. But I was missing people. This is a work about people. And without the people, it feels like something important missing. Yeah. So I'm happy to see everybody here today. You know, like, finally, everyone can have their own experience. And it will, the debate will come back to me you know, in different ways. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Um, the, the hypothesis, the proposal that Dr. Yu made was a hypothesis that the troops would see the art as something sacred, something not to be touched. And I think we're struggling, I certainly feel like I'm struggling right now in this country as we experience what we call polarization a question of what, whether there are things that we all share as sacred or not, or whether we are finding ourselves so polarized that half of us see a certain set of values or objects or experiences or cultural experiences as sacred, and the other half see a different set as sacred, but we don't find something common that you could put on a barricade and say, no one, no one would touch that because we all agree yeah. it's sacred. And I'm curious whether that conversation about what is shared and sacred was present in the making of this work and what you found, if it was, what you found in that, like what you saw in that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure not everyone will have the agreement that what's valuable, what has less value, what should be, you know, the question earlier, should be culture heritage or not, you know, right. the history books are designed not to be like, you know, really, um, objective about this as well, and that's something the terminology, the selection needs to be fixed. So it's, at the end, this is a created work, you know, group show. Right. So I, it could have been many different ways. So if I was another artist, it would be differently. Or if museum gets this work, have it in the collection, they might also pick other works, put it in five years, ten years. You know, the director's vision change, directors change, but then there is the collection with the past formation idea about what should be the heritage. So there's a lot of artworks that random in museum collections. I went to the stories of many museums, to Tate, to Pompidou, to Harvard museums. Like I saw a lot of works that the head of, uh, you know, uh, uh, collection just had no idea it's there or they had no idea why it's there. And, you know, so this is an ongoing, very fresh debate. Uh, what I would say, museums are collectively owned places. They are culture heritage, like as spaces. So they are not very personal in that sense. It's collectively owned. Uh, even if sometimes people are forced to pay to enter the museum, they are still the owners of the museum. So we need to have this mentality of like this dynamic process of making it better all the time. Uh, not personal way, but in a collective way, it's very important. So for an artist as well, I shouldn't be just focusing on my installation, how good it looks, and I get the better corner, but I should think about like what's happening in the other corner. And if 
if that artist is like resting in peace, everything is taken care of well, or you know we challenge each other, uh, and you know I, in this case I don't contact directly to artists. Usually I contact them and we collaborate. But I like that they gave the uh, works to the museum without thinking in the future a crazy artist will come and do that with their work. <laughs> you know, if they didn't think about that, they should better be fine with it. <laughs> so. Except Hans Hacke, you always have the condition, no one can do this crazy stuff, they need to ask me. And we were gonna like ask him, but uh, I met him and he likes this work, so I know he would give permission. I like, no, let's, let's do the others, so, because they didn't think about it. Um, so I think this, this is important, like it's not to uh, make it worse, it's actually make it better to understand it's a collective responsibility. And, um, and an artwork is not an isolated thing. It has always part. It's part of a narrative. Like this is also part of the narrative. Narrative in the next rooms, you know, goes all the way back to whatever century, like very early uh, Mesopotamian era. So we have we are talking about thousands of years here, within these three four rooms actually already. The work will be here till December. Uh, it's the last chance for the last question. Uh, yeah, nine minutes. Uh, I have a comment actually. As you know, I went yeah. to Berlin a really long time back, and I don't know if they still have it, but back when I went, there was this thing where students could rent, not rent, take out art for the uh, yeah. yeah. And I would always have a really hard time wrapping my head around the college trusting students mm -hmm. would damage. I wonder how that goes into dialogue of this. Yeah. Like, on the one hand, Students have all access. Yeah. Another hand, idea here is that the artwork is precious, so we do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's uh, five dollars. You can borrow uh, a wide selection of artworks so, yeah. and put it in your dormitory for a year or yeah, so last on. Semester. Yeah. So last December, that was the time they were returning the artwork. So I was seeing students walking around <laughs> with, the, with like Sophie Carl and whatever they borrowed, and this was like amazing thing to see that it's only like five dollars. You just pay like a. a insurance uh, fee mm -hmm. and uh, only t only other institution I know doing that is uh, MBK in Berlin. If you are a resident in Berlin, you can actually go and borrow artworks from their collection and really like, you know, you can borrow an Ellen Capro and put it in your house. Uh, you just have to sign up to it and, and I think this is an amazing initiative and it really goes in line with this installation. That's why we have Ellen Johnson's little portrait in the back hidden who we'll come up with this idea also another contemporary conceptual idea in 1940s, I think, right? It started. So it's very early on, uh, yeah, very avant-garde idea and it's still functioning and happening. And I was really like, is anything happening? Like actually, it's just fine. All these years, there's no like crazy story, something happens in artwork. So it's amazing that it's functional. Yeah, this is a good example for like this collective ownership and collective culture heritage. Well, yeah. let's thank our thank thank you. You.